We're going to have bring up Peter Hyman to go ahead and do an introduction to this Paul Schrade interview. Mr. Peter. Thank you so much. So this place is magic. And um, I want to just take a couple seconds of your time and ask you to close your eyes. It's Sunday. This isn't a sermon. OK, now, how many of you have been on the ride to Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland? Raise your hand. OK, so picture a treasure chest full of jewels, rubies, and diamonds and emeralds and gold chalices and silver and necklaces and so on. Okay, open your eyes, you've got the vision. So that's what this place is. That's what this conference is. We have a, a variety of talent here at this conference that is unavailable any place else. Oh, I forgot to say, I am not the owner of the Alchins Negative. <laughs> Okay, so I'm 71. Actually, I'm 17 and dyslexic. But um, I'm really pleased to say that I'm like a strip of magnesium. It burns and burns and burns and burns, and then it gets really bright before it goes out. I don't plan to go out anytime soon, but I just want all of you to know that uh, I'm living in a magic place right now. And... Um, such a joy to have three of my passions come to full power at this point in my life. I've been working since I was seven years old on photography. Been working since I was uh, 18 or 19, 21 years old since on the uh, Bobby Kennedy assassination. And I've been working all my life to create good relationships with people. And you're all magic. Everybody I've met here has been magic. Some are a little bit more agreeable magic than others, but you know, you know how that goes. Uh, it's part of life. So, I mean, we've been privileged to meet, and these are just highlights. Uh, Judith, Cyril Wecht, Mr. Tannenbaum, Mr. Fetzer. Um, and then last night at my dinner table, one of the most exciting things was, there was a young couple, JB and Heather. Young, interested. And um, Heather was like squirming with joy that she was able to buy a, a Robert Kennedy bumper sticker that I had from when I was campaigning for him. And it just brought me such great joy to know that there are, are young people interested in this project, these projects. And so, I, you know, I really would like to thank you. As a result of the time I've put into this and the people I've met, um, Again, uh, the circumstances converged such that I was honored enough to go with Jim Ellis, the wonderful camera person, to interview Mr. Paul Schrade in his home in Hollywood. And um, Paul will tell the whole story, so I don't need to really give any more introduction. But again, looking at it from the human standpoint, which is really, I think, why we're all in this, uh, because we want a better world for humanity. Uh, and my experience of Paul was that he is just such a wonderful human and this circumstance befell him and he's been a victim of it, but a soldier fighting his way forward ever since. So um, thank you for being here and um, please enjoy the video. And uh, Mr. Ellis, what's that? Oh yeah, we'll dim the lights. Schrade. And the purpose of this interview is to stream this to the JFK conference, which runs from the 16th through the 18th of November in Dallas, and um, have you enjoy the words of Mr. Paul Schrade, who was the labor chair for the campaign of Mr. Robert Kennedy. Thank you for consenting to this interview. Um, we're all anxious to hear what you have to say. And um, We'd like basically to hear from you how you came to, a little bit about your personal history, your professional history, and then how you met Robert Kennedy and take us on into the, um, the pantry at the hotel. Anyway, Peter, welcome to our home. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be able to do this. 
Unfortunately, I quit flying, so can't be at the conference, but this is one way to get uh, the message to the conference. Wonderful. So, um, how did you come to meet Robert Kennedy, and what was your relationship with him before the assassination? The well, first meeting was at the 56th Democratic Convention in Chicago. Uh, I, we had set up a uh, United Auto Workers Union uh, room uh, to greet other delegates. And as Walter Russo, the president of my union, president of the UAW, and I approached the room, Bob and Jack Kennedy came out. Mm. And uh, Jack Kennedy came over and says, Walter, I would like your support for the vice presidency. And Walter said, young man, you've got to change your voting record. <laughs> and everybody sort of laughed at that point. They, they went on. Uh, 1960, um, I was actually, uh, had been an officer of my local union, but had uh, worked, uh, began working in Detroit as administrative assistant to Walter Roos as the president of the United Auto Workers Union. I went to Walter and said, look, Stevenson obviously is not making a real, really big push on this. Uh, I'd like to support Jack Kennedy like you are. And uh, Walter said, fine. So he called Bob right there in front of me. <clears throat> Bob said, send Paul back to California. He was part of the Stevenson delegation. Tell him to bring over those delegates to, to Kennedy, to Jack Kennedy, which was my assignment mm -hmm. at that point. Anyway, I went back to L.A. and uh, worked very closely with Bob through two weeks ahead of the convention. Got to know him then mm. and found out a really very pleasant, good guy. He, he has his tough side, but on a personal level, he was always very wonderful, and uh, we got to be become friends. In the mid-afternoon, Bob Kennedy came back and said, Walter, he said, uh, what's happening with the Michigan delegation? He said, you've got a really good leverage with them. Because you know there are a lot of them from Detroit and uh, other other major cities, and uh, what what's what's going to be happening? He said, "Well, they're off the floor, and they're discussing whether they're going to support Kennedy or not." Because uh, Governor Williams wanted to be the vice president candidate and had told Kennedy this uh, during the afternoon. So. Uh, I said to Bob, I said, look, here's Lyndon Johnson's statement where he's supporting every uh, uh, social justice, economic justice program of the platform, which is something new for him. Mm -hmm. We ought to get that to our guys because uh, two vice presidents were trying to coax the delegation over because the convention had come to a standstill and the Michigan delegation was off the floor. And Bob says, that's a great idea, Paul. And then he laughed. He says, but none of us are delegates. So the guy with him reached into his pocket, picked, pulled out a Texas delegate badge. Bob grabbed it, pinned it on me. He says, Paul, go to the convention. <laughs> so I went to the convention to try to get this Johnson statement into, the, into our guys in the, in the Michigan delegation. Well, that's the kind of thing that Bob respected because uh, it was something that really helped getting uh, uh, that, that problem solved. And, uh, so we became very fast good friends with that. And we had a lot of fun during the convention. Uh, we, we spent time uh, uh, talking about it, working with other people, going to the bar, and, and uh, uh, it was just a good relationship we built at that point. It was great. Well, uh, Dolores took us out on the picket line. And uh, mm -hmm. so we picketed the Giorgio uh, uh, grape uh, vineyards. Uh, it was a, one of the biggest in, in California. And Bob walked the picket lines there. And the first time I'd ever been on a picket line with a, with a guy like this. And, uh, and so it, it was just a wonderful day. And, and, and Bob really captured the whole spirit of the farm worker struggle at that point and uh, led him to do things in Washington to, to be supportive. So would it, would it be fair to say that you could see that he really felt he was really being him and not just walking through the motions of being there? Yeah, because he, he really was a, you know, he had a very direct relationship immediately with Cesar Chavez and with Dolores. 
and uh, they're lovable people and doing great work. And, and uh, Bob was really a champion of social economic justice anyway, uh, because he was working with native tribes in, in the United States. He'd gone to uh, South Africa and worked with uh, poor people there, challenging the administration. He went to the South, uh, into Mississippi, and. So he was really getting himself involved and committed uh, to all the, the, dealing with a lot of these individual problems that people were having. So take us forward to Los Angeles. Um, how did you find yourself being at the Ambassador Hotel? And um, walk through that process with us. Well, it starts with the farm workers again. Uh, uh, Bob Kennedy was the only politician invited to the, uh, to celebrate the end of Cesar Chavez's fast against violence. Uh, that he, that, uh, and he was really a very sick guy. And the only politician that he wanted there was Bob Kennedy. So Bob came out with some of his people t uh, to his rally uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the farm workers. And 10,000 people at the, at the, uh, at the, at the park. And, and Bob was so well received there. Uh, and um, so afterwards, uh, I was on my way back to LA. I went back to the airport where we picked him up and uh, to take him to, to the, uh, the end of the uh, fast. And I said, you know, these people need the presidency more than anybody and people like them. And I talked to him about this. Well, he didn't say no, he didn't, pushed me off. He started asking me questions about what's happening in politics in California. He said, well, something's happening here. Well, that Friday, he announced oh. in D.C., announced that he was running. And, uh, and that was on a Friday. I went back to Detroit. I was on the, uh, the national board of the OAW representing uh, the Western states. And so uh, I, I flew overnight. Uh, got in the parking lot as Walter Ruther, the president of my union, my mentor, uh, was there. And I said, well, there's some things happening in California I'd like to talk to you about before I go back to L.A. And he said, it's the first thing on the agenda, young man. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> something happening here. So he took, uh, he took me on, on my, because I endorsed Robert Kennedy on Friday. When he announced, I endorsed attacking Johnson, the war, uh, and the war, and because uh, I was in the anti-war movement. Walter was not in the anti-war movement. Uh -huh. And he used to call me in after board meetings and lecture me about how to do this. And I would lecture him back, saying, you, you've got to get involved. And, and uh, he would say, well, you're not doing it in the right way. You've got to do it. I said, that's why we need you there. But he was sticking with Johnson, and I was not. Uh, and that was the, the confrontation we were having at the board meeting. That night, I got a call from Jess Unruh, who was chairman of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the Kennedy campaign in California, saying, what's happened with Cesar Chavez? Is he going on the delegation? Well, I said, well, Bob was supposed to call him today. What, what do you know about that? And he said, I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jack Conway had Bob's home phone number. I called Bob at home, got him immediately. I said, what happened? He said, well, he sounded so sick and so weak. I didn't have the heart to ask him to go up against George Meany, the president of the AFL-CIO, because they're now supporting the farm workers. And I said, well, that doesn't sound like Cobo and SOB you're supposed to be. And there's this little pause, and he, then he laughed. He says, yeah, Paul, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> so he said, what do you think? I said, we absolutely need Senator on the delegation. So he said, uh, well, what can you do? I said, I'll call him. So I called him. and. Uh, this was late at night in Detroit, but still early in LA and in California. So I was able to talk to Caesar. So all these things, you know, there's all these ha things happen within an hour. And so uh, I, I talked to Caesar. I said, Bob really needs you. Can you do something? He said, I'm going to call a meeting. So he called a meeting that night. A hundred. Uh, I, call, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning. A hundred uh, ranch chairmen from the union had showed up. And they had unanimously instructed Cesar to go on the delegation. I said, yeah, George Meany's going to understand that kind of democracy. So 
that we had Cesar on the delegation, which was key to this because uh, Latino uh, vote in the, in the farm, er, farm areas as well as the big cities was really important to yeah. the Kennedy campaign. And it was, we found out. So you weren't allowed to use your staff members? Staff or any UAW money. Uh -huh. uh, but without my knowing it until much later, one of our staff guys who was doing our political work found uh, a really large grant from Frank Mankiewicz of the, uh, of the campaign. So we had the money to get people out. Uh, uh, staff members on their own went out and campaigned. So uh, I wasn't going to let Walter just deter me from all this kind of activity. It wasn't right. As far as I was concerned, and it wasn't like him to do that. Mm -hmm. Election day, he comes to California. Uh, we go to Santa Monica to reopen negotiations on a, our collective bargaining agreement with, with uh, McDonnell Douglas. We go up, on, we fly up north to meet with the vice president of the Teamsters Union, Einer Mohn, uh, who's a really good guy and, and uh, and not fighting the farm workers. Anyway, we go up to have a, a meeting with him. On the way up, he says, how are you guys doing? How are you Kennedy guys doing on the board? Because we had a board of about uh, nearly 30 people. That I was one of the members. And he said, well, about a third of them were for Kennedy and a third of them for uh, uh, Johnson. And uh, a third of whatever you tell them to do. Mm -hmm. He kind of frowned at that. <laughs> But he was still supporting Johnson at that point on election day, mm. and uh, which was really, but uh, it's responsible for my big grin on the victory speech when <laughs> Bob was making his victory speech. Yeah. I was grinning widely because widely I knew that, uh, that uh, we had won and uh, that it would probably be okay now with, with Luther because he would be supporting uh, Kennedy at that point. That had to be a magnificent feeling, to be there on the stage and know that you had the momentum, yeah. sitting there grinning. Um, can you describe the feeling at all? Well, we had, you know, I had gone up north with Ruther, flew back, was, I lived uh, between the airport and the hotel. Mm -hmm. And I hate victory parties because there was a lot of drinking noise, a lot of smoking at that point. So I, I was going home, and then I heard on the radio that uh, Gene McCarthy was in the lead. I said, oh God, I better go down. So I went to the hotel, and one of Bob's people came up to me and said, Bob heard you came, got to the hotel, and he said, well, you're upstairs on the fifth floor, which the, the fifth floor had been taken over by the family and the staff, and uh, just everything was really happy at that point. The spirits had picked up because Bob was then leading. Mm. So uh, we spent some time talking together about what about the campaign and uh, uh, things like you know Kenny O'Donnell, uh, uh, Jack Kennedy's chief of staff, now working for Bob, called in and said everything's okay with Chicago because uh, uh, what's his name, the mayor, Mayor Daly. Yeah. Uh, so. Kenny O'Donnell calls and says everything good, is good with Mayor Daly because uh -huh. Mayor Daly was actually working for Johnson. I got a lot of the phone calls off the, uh, the, the LBJ library at that period. And so uh, everything's okay. Then uh, George McGovern called in saying he'd won in, in South Dakota. And he said, <clears throat> you also beat uh, McCarthy here. And the Lakota tribe had voted like 69 to 2 for you and, and uh, Gene McCarthy. So these are all big moments in our, at that point. So we finally decided to go downstairs and Bob had uh, invited me to go in the room with him and Frank Mankiewicz and, and uh, Fred Dutton of his campaign and uh, talk over the, the, the list of people to be uh, recognized.
downstairs. And Bob had uh, invited me to go in the room with him and Frank Mankiewicz and, and uh, Fred Dutton of his campaign and uh, talk over the, the, the list of people to be uh, recognized. And uh, we left the room, and Bob on the way down says, uh, look, I understand Cesar had to, Cesar Tubman had to leave, uh, and, but Dolores Huerta is going to be with us on, on, on the platform. And, uh, but he said, we didn't put her name on the list. Can you do something about that? So I dropped out and uh, went to a room, picked up a piece of paper, and wrote her name down. They had already gone down the elevator. Well, a couple of guys I was working with, we ran down the stairs from the fifth floor, actually caught up with them in the kitchen where he was being greeted, you know, Viva Kennedy, Kennedy mm -hmm. for President. Uh, again, working poor people working in the, in the kitchens, uh, uh, people that supported Bob. And uh, so we went out the platform, had this wonderful reception. Can I just ask, if I may, um, were there a lot of uh, non-kitchen workers in the kitchen at that time, or did the kitchen fill up later after the speech? And did you see anything? Did you feel anything? No, there was nobody in the kitchen no. that we knew about. Okay. And uh, uh, so went about the platform, and Bob made his victory speech, and uh, he then confused his own bodyguard, uh, Bill Barry, a former FBI agent, who was, who, oh. who was the only gun-carrying guy on the, on the staff. Uh, actually lost him. So Bob went, I was supposed to come off the front of the stage, but he, uh, on the other side, but he went off the back of the stage being led by Carl Eucher, okay. his escort, uh -huh. assistant major D. And they wound up down uh, uh, behind uh, the platform on a lower level, the kitchen level, uh, where, uh, This PR guy. Um, anyway, they got to the the kitchen level behind the platform, and uh, they talked about what to do. They were supposed to go from there down the stairwell to the uh, embassy room. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were supposed to get downstairs to the ambassador room, where there's another 1,500 farm worker. Uh, mm -hmm. Assembled to be, to be part of the victory, and they decided at that point, based upon the media asking, uh, to come over to the uh, colonial room, which was a right turn rather than a left turn, mm -hmm. which took Bob uh, through into the pantry area, not into the kitchen, but into the pantry area, and uh, where he was confronted. I had gotten there earlier because I knew he was coming in, in that direction. Uh, and was waiting for them. There hardly anybody in there, a few kitchen workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it immediately filled up. And uh, so uh, I was standing right behind Bob at that point. I was shaking hands with Jesus Perez and, and Juan Romero. Mm -hmm. And I remember the looks on their faces that reminded me of what was happening in, in Delano with Chavez. And, so the looks on their faces were like elation, elation and, yeah. and, ah, and, 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 we, and you, that was contagious for you? Yeah, it was, because it reminded me of our first meetings in, in Delano with, Far with Chavez. Uh, well, I stepped back at that point because Bob said, I want you and Jess with me at the Holy Room media conference, which was on the other end of the pantry. So I stepped back, and that's when... Uh, uh, and I had turned around at that point, and that's when the television lights went on, and I was sort of blinded, and then I started shaking and went down. I didn't know I'd been shot at that point. I just uh, thought maybe being electrocuted, so I passed out at that point. Yeah. And um, so then you, you sort of wavered in and out of consciousness? Yeah, and, and uh, a doctor was with me holding, it was behind me holding my head because I was bleeding. I got hit in the top of the head, the bullet went in and out, left a little part of the skull there, which they took out, so I got a really big dent up there. Anyway, uh, I wasn't in any, any pain at that point, but just very weak and uh, in and out of consciousness. The doctor says, you're gonna be okay. Uh, we're taking you to Central Receiving Hospital. I said, 
And I remembered the Kaiser plan. <laughs> so was that the moment that you realized you'd been shot, or did you figure it yeah, out? I, oh. Yeah, I figured that out. Wow. He says, you're going to be okay. And uh, I didn't know that at that point. I didn't know Bob had been shot for a bit, but I then found out that he did. And uh, he was shot and uh, in, in pretty bad shape. Um, and, you know, another doctor came to me and said, you know, uh, uh, you know, I said, take care of Bob. And, uh, and so then I, you know, and, and checking out what really happened. And then, uh, I find out uh, that uh, United Press and FBI had a statement from a guy who actually was a student uh, and a Republican. He heard Bob say, is everybody okay? Is Paul all right? And uh, I never really believed that, but uh, another one of the doctors also told the FBI, I said, uh, I, uh, Bob asked about Paul, and, and, and uh, he said, Paul, I just checked Paul's heart rate. He's going to be okay. And Bob closed uh, that one eye that he that was open. So, well, Juan Romero, was the most quoted on this because he was holding Bob. And he said, Bob said, uh, is everybody okay? Well, a young guy who was interviewed by UPI and, uh, UPI and they, they wrote it, <clears throat> said he heard Bob say, is everybody okay? Is Paul all right? And I always went with that. I, I never really used that at all because I wasn't really sure about it. I became more sure about it when uh, Dr. Simon Abel, who was one of the four or five doctors that treated Bob, because he, he told the FBI, he said, well, uh, Bob asked him how Paul was. And, and he said to Bob, uh, Paul's all right. Uh, uh, I checked his heartbeat and he's, he's gonna be okay. And that uh, Bob closed that last open eye. You know. what, does that, what does that mean? I mean, it touches my heart. I'm not Paul. Yeah. You are. What, what, does that, what does that mean to you that he would... Well, it means a lot to me that he was concerned and that they knew, that he knew that I'd been shot and was so understanding at that point. You know, what, it, it takes a really good person to be concerned about somebody else when he's there shot and lay dying, you know. Uh, it just touched me very deeply to know that he, he felt that way. Yeah. It was those kind of things that, you know, uh, that really get to you. Uh, and I, I tried to find out other things he said when Ethel was delayed. In fact, she was pushed down when, when the shooting started by uh, Rayford Johnson and Rosie Greer and Bill Barry. And when she got to Bob, uh, Bob said, Ethel, oh, Ethel. And she says, Bobby, you're going to be okay. And uh, his last words were when they were picking up, uh, picking him up and putting him on a gurney, he says, no, no, don't move me. And uh, that was it. I was always interested in what was happening in those last moments, and I, uh, it's part of my f study of what happened afterwards. Well, I was in and out of a consciousness, yeah. and I don't know, I never knew I was in surgery, but the next morning I woke up and Walter Ruther uh, was there, and he told me that Bob had died that night. and. Uh, and uh, I just couldn't face him at that point. I just turned away and was just, uh, just couldn't handle it. So what, after that what? I mean, you must have been much of a, like a zombie at work. Uh, no, I didn't go back to work. I, I, I was really in, in, in bad shape physically mm -hmm. and uh, emotionally. And um, I, 
It took me a while to get back to work, but you know, people said, you're just too angry, depressed, you're not doing your job very well. Uh, a year or so later, I was defeated for office. I really didn't run very hard. I just didn't, I decided, you know, this wasn't for me anymore. Mm. And uh, uh, went back to work in the factory. From the uh, wide array and deep pile of assassination study materials that you have here in your lovely home, when did the fire to get involved in finding out the truth come to you? Well, I couldn't handle anything. I was, you know, just out of it, just so depressed by what happened, losing Bob. And uh, uh, Alan Lowenstein, who was, uh, had been a member of the Congress, a good friend of Bob's, helped write some of his speeches, uh, came to me uh, here, slept on our sofa, uh, moved in across the street, but worked for Jerry Brown when Jerry was running for president. Well, he said, look, there are serious questions about uh, this case. And he said, I'm interested in finding out. He says, I've been meeting with some people. And he said, uh, in fact, there's some people in your neighborhood here that are working on the case. I didn't know have I didn't know there were any questions about this. I thought it was Sir Han, and had not really understood that there's other things happening. Well, they had a photograph, a picture a friend of theirs had taken, showing two bullet holes in the door frame, which meant more than eight bullets because the police were saying uh, one gunman, long gunman, uh, Sir Han Bishar, Sir Han, and. Uh, eight bullets uh, he fired and uh, so the two bullets in the door frame were more than their count yes so that that gave us some some leverage at that point well we did the right thing we went to uh, the chief of police sat down with him talked to him about some of the evidence we'd gathered Allard had put together some material asked him these questions and he said well look put your questions in writing and we'll get back to you never heard from him oh, no. so send us a question if we can't find your questions this happened two or three times they just fluffed us up we found out later there was a uh, order in the, uh, the police department do not answer uh low and scenes and strange questions because it would contradict what we've been saying publicly. In order, which came from where? From the chief. Chief. Yeah. And do you think he received orders from somewhere else? We don't know. Uh. We don't go there. We go by what we know. Okay. Uh, so I'm working with Allard, and, and we uh, did a lot of investigation. I went to court a few times once to find, get the evidence. We got a few photographs, that's all. We went to the police commission and asked these questions, and they said, uh, no, we, we won't answer your questions, and we won't give you any information. And, and they decide who the police chief is going to be. They hire and fire. So that was a main uh, defeat for us. Uh, I went to uh, uh, court uh, on the ba basis of, uh, of uh, finding out uh, having an analysis of the bullet and, uh, mm -hmm. and the gun evidence uh, that they used in the trial of Sirhan. Because Sirhan had been uh, convicted uh, without witnesses, without any bullet evidence, without any forensics at all, uh, and convicted and sent to the gas chamber. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's the way it all stood. So uh, we went to court, uh, Judge Robert Wanky is Superior Court here in LA, uh, adopted our application. CBS Networks out of New York uh, mm -hmm. and their local attorneys also filed the same application.
with Alan Lowenstein, uh, who's our major uh, work as our, my lawyer, along with Mel Levine, uh, who now works for Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. Uh, he's still around, fortunately. So we went to court uh, with, along with CBS, and uh, uh, Judge Robert Oinke, head of the Superior Court, uh, asked the LAPD and the district attorney to submit the gun and bullet evidence they used in the Saran mm -hmm. trial. And they did. And uh, a panel was set up. Each one of us uh, who were part of this, uh, I chose a panelist, so did CBS, so did the district attorney, so did the police chief, so did a couple of other people involved in this thing. Uh, so the panelists were all very good criminalists, uh, all with good records. <clears throat> and there were six, and the six chose a seventh uh, uh, to, to head the panel. <clears throat> they were given instructions, given the evidence, and they went to work uh, for two or three weeks. And they came back with a uh, decision. They decided that uh, there was no second gunman, and uh, based upon uh, their study of the evidence to, as, as criminalists, uh, and that's what these middle-aged reporters, they ran to the phones with no second gun, no second gun. Actually, one of the members of the panel that, representing CBS that night uh, criticized Cronkite's report like that saying that was not our total decision. We said there's evidence there could have been a second gunman. So it wasn't just a flat decision, but that never made uh -huh. the, the papers at all. So here we were stuck. We had no idea what went on uh, with that. Uh, and uh, it was only uh, about a year ago that I understood what was happening. So, Paul, do you see any correlations, lines, interconnections between the assassination of Robert Kennedy and his brother John? There could be, but I don't see any, and I, I, I'm not looking for any. Mm -hmm. uh, my strategy uh, was, I think, a, a winning strategy, is to go after the evidence, go after the prosecution's own evidence, and, and doing an analysis of the case and not coming up with uh, conspiracy theories or uh, the fact that he was programmed, and he could have been, because you get tossed out of court at that point, and mm. that's what's happened. 50 years of good lawyers, Sir has never been able to make, a, make it in the courtroom, even though he is innocent of shooting Robert Kennedy. And so that's the position I take. Proving his innocence, uh, we, we're uh, now uh, working with a one of the uh, innocence projects in California. There's three of them. I don't mm -hmm. want to name the one uh, that we're working with because it's it's got to be confidential at this point. But we're working to clear his name uh, on the on the murder of Robert Kennedy because there was a second gunman. The prosecution's own evidence shows that Sirhan could not have shot Robert Kennedy. Their own evidence shows the second gunman did shoot Robert Kennedy. And so that's my job, is to make the case for Saran and clear him of the murder and, and, and focus in on getting a new investigation. Not a reinvestigation, a new investigation that they never did, even though they had the goods on the second gunman. They never investigated it. What uh, excellent discipline and self-control, because I know there must be temptations to do many things. No, no, I'm not tempted that way. Uh, I think we had this kind of discussion yesterday, why I'm involved this way, uh, and I thought about it after we talked. Mm -hmm. It's because my work in high school and, and the university was in science. I was a chemistry math major. Oh. So this is why I can uh, review the evidence 
and work with the evidence without getting into uh, the imaginary stuff or even the truth of the matter. Uh, we don't know the whole truth behind uh, the second gunman. But we first of all have to establish that Sirhan was not because worldwide he's considered the second, uh, he's considered the gunman. I get, you know, um, a Google alert. All over the world, he's, he's, the, he's the guy. Even members of the Kennedy family have gone and said, you know, an Arab killed my father. Huh. They're not saying that anymore. Uh, and that's part of my strategy. I worked several years working on young Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's now joined forces on, 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 on being part of the, the new investigation. In fact, he went to visit Sirhan in prison mm -hmm. down in San Diego, as I did a couple of years ago, and went to his parole board hearing, trying to make the case. Of course, it's frustrating because the parole board's not going to do anything, haven't done anything in 15 different parole board yeah. hearings. But it, it's, it's something that makes the case that he didn't do it. Yes. And Bobby doing this. Now, one of the other... Uh, persons uh, I worked with on the case, Kathleen has recently come out. Mm -hmm. She's the eldest of the Kennedys. Uh, I also include Ethel on our side in this one, although she hasn't done, said anything about the case itself, but she said, you know, it was good that we came out uh, against the death penalty uh, for Sir Han, mm -hmm. because if he had been executed as it was decided, it would have poisoned us. So she brings in a whole s spiritual context in this. Mm. So I count her into the team. Uh, oh, wonderful. And uh, I often tell members of family who are not with us, I'm doing exactly what Robert Kennedy was trying to do in solving uh, his, his brother's case. Uh -huh. Because he was into the archives after he became US Senator. He was into the Department of Just Justice archives with with uh, his in chief investigator mm -hmm. uh, going over the records. Those were in Sacramento, right? No, in, in D.C. Yeah. Oh, D.C., okay. Yeah, the JFK records. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were going after, into, he, so he was involved in JFK records. And I said, I'm doing what he was doing in order to put another Kennedy stamp on, on, on what, uh -huh. what I'm trying to do. I think you may be aware, but um, we have invited um, Robert Kennedy Jr. to uh, attend yeah, the conference. I've seen him. He man. respectfully declined because he's busy working on a couple of very important cases. Yeah. So we certainly respect that, and we wish that it had been otherwise. Yeah. There's a part of the manuscript over there. He he did a book on the family mm. and had two chapters on JFK and RFK. But he decided not to go with those, just do the family thing. That's been published. Mm -hmm. He's now working on JFK, RFK, uh, with a guy named Dick Lester, who's got a, uh -huh. a lot of good books out on, on JFK. Uh -huh. And he lives very close by, and we're working together to, so that Bobby's coming out with, with a book on both after his. Uh, uh -huh. So what is your experience? What, taking an overview, what has happened to labor since 1968 up until today? And try to be brief, because I bet you could talk for quite some time on it. Well, it's very clear. Uh, Republicans and business have taken over our elections, and we've, uh, <coughs> labor movement, like most progressive groups, are in bad shape in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse under Donald Trump, because uh, he's the worst of all of them. But, uh, the labor movement has been going downhill since 1970, mm. and you can feel it and, 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 uh, and, and hear it. Uh, and that's why in, in 72, I didn't feel too bad about going back to work in the factory, where I could do some union work uh, directly, yes. and, uh, knowing that politically we were in trouble, and that are mm -hmm. in trouble and have been in trouble for a long time. I see. I'm going to continue as long as I can, be 94 in December, uh, to try to solve the Robert Kennedy case, uh, as some of you are doing, and most of you are doing in so solving the John Kennedy case. They're both very, very difficult cases, uh, made more difficult because every establishment 
group we work with uh, has been opposed to it, uh, not cooperative, and, uh, and, and keeps things hidden from us. So it's a very difficult uh, road we're on, but uh, if we pursue and, and continue, I think we'll get someplace someday. We have to, because these two important murders are a black mark on our country and our people, and I think this is what the American people want. They want these cases solved, and hopefully together we can do it. What would you say to the young people who were not alive when Bobby was alive or John was alive? What's in it for them? I think what uh, young people can do is not only to learn about these cases, but study that period and show where both Kennedys were making real progress in terms of, of, of building uh, our power, building our justice system so that uh, people could have a better life in this country. Uh, I see young people really doing a lot of great work now, and uh, there are a lot of issues out there. Uh, the, the shootings in our schools, uh, the fact that uh, the education system is, is, is creaking along and not giving uh, decent uh, education to millions of young people. Uh, there are a lot of issues out there that young people can do something about, and I'm relying on you, and uh, I know a lot of adults like me are relying on you as young people as well. The money and the power of corporations and, uh, and, and uh, uh, right-wing groups in this country that have taken over the politics, have taken over our elections. You can just see it in this election right now where uh, so many people are off the rolls, deliberately taking off the, uh, the rolls in this election. In several states this is happening, and it's been happening. And I think that's the power of the money and the, and the corporations and the right-wing organizations in this country have just taken over our politics. And we've got to take the politics back by organizing. And this is where young people, I think, have got new inspiration now and women have i think a, a lot of our uh, hope in this election is because of the way women are being treated and now rebelling against that treatment and organizing themselves and organizing us to do something about those problems and, and you know a lot of men are doing this too but uh, men have not been able to solve the problem and, and the fact that women are getting abused and acting up against abuse and and uh, uh, being uh, so supportive of health care. Uh, these are the issues that are counting in this election at this point. And uh, hopefully that will bring a better turnout despite the fact that people are being thrown off the rolls. Well, I'd like to be optimistic about solving the Robert Kennedy case and the John Kennedy case. Uh, even the Dr. King and the, uh, the other assassinations that we've been faced with, the Mal uh, Malcolm X. Uh, we don't know how to find the answers is the problem. And so finding the answers is, is uh, I'm very pessimistic about. Oh, pessimistic or? Pessimistic. Oh, fine. Oh. Wait, you're pessimistic to? I'm pessimistic about finding answers to these cases. I think we are in the struggle to find them. I'm doing what I can. People involved with the JFK case are doing what they can. Uh, some people are still working on Dr. King, Malcolm X. Uh, but we aren't getting any place uh, because the establishment, again, holds the key to what we are talking about. We don't have that key yet. We don't have the power in, 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 in government in order to open up these cases. Uh, and we have to build towards that. And uh, I'm somewhat optimistic this year that with the young people, with women, actually becoming part of the the, the power of this country and, and deciding who's going to be uh, in the Congress uh, is, is the only hopeful sign I see. So are you, are you saying that the evidence is there, it's just that the establishment keeps it Yeah, tight. yeah. It's all locked up. 
you know, I think the problems of this country, uh, we see uh, the, the sickness as a result of the loss of uh, Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy to, to assassination, to assassination and not solving those assassinations has, has really uh, uh, damaged our democracy uh, because uh, we don't know the answers, but we're prevented from getting the answers by the establishment. And the establishment is, is guilty. Mr. Schwey, thank you so very much for your time. Okay. Thank you for your courage and for rebounding from what could have ended a person's uh, Nearly. viable life. Nearly did. And um, thank you for the hard work you're doing and uh, we're on your side, sir. Thank you. What a rare opportunity that was. Uh, Mind-blowing sort of had the feeling like I'm not worthy, and yet in my soul I knew I was. Um, so we're gonna do something special. Um, Paul couldn't be here, and setting up a Skype connection uh, was more difficult than we were able to make happen. So um, what I'd like to ask of you now is to please stand and say thank you to Paul, and between myself and Randy, we're gonna video your thanks to him for doing this. So. Let's hear it for Mr. Paul Schrade. Thank you, thank you. So a couple of things. Number one, um, I really want to extend uh, thanks to um, Jim Ellis for being the cameraman. He's done two other interviews with me so far, uh, one with John Barber and one with David Lifton, and uh, we're planning to do more. And um, thank you to Randy uh, Benson over there for the brilliant video work that he's done thus far as well. Uh, one other thing is that um, while we were there, uh, some of you have already heard this, but um, when I was in college, I was on Bobby Kennedy's campaign team, and I ended up with several envelopes, mailing envelopes, that had the logo on it. And um, they were sitting in my barn and getting older and older, just like me, and thank goodness I thought of this, because if I were to pass away, um, my kids probably wouldn't know what the value was, and they might have ended up in a dumpster somewhere. But took them to Paul's home and uh, asked him if he would please autograph those envelopes. And he did, and I took a picture of him autographing the envelopes to validate the, the authenticity. And um, Judith um, and the organization here have some of those envelopes, and they have plans to make those available for auction um, or whatever. It's, it's, it's in their hands. But, um, so that's what's cooking. So last thing is, thank you very much.